On the show today, a deal for a ceasefire and hostage release is reported to be in the works. Just how close is it? The sticking points, uh, honestly, uh, uh, at this stage are more uh, practical, logistical, uh, not really uh, something represent the core of, of the deal. Plus, we'll see how life has changed in a seaside Israeli city after October 7th. At the beginning of the war, I was in the shelter for one week. I didn't leave the house, so it was very hard for me because I didn't saw a person. I didn't, I didn't know nothing. And later, the U.S. Secretary of Defense is in Kyiv. We examine a connection between Hamas and Moscow, and we see an Israeli school where Jews and Arabs learn side by side. Today is Monday, November 20th, and this is VOA's Flashpoint Global Crises. Good evening, I'm Steve Karish in Washington. Houthis from Yemen capture a ship in the Red Sea claiming it belongs to Israel. That story in a few minutes. Now, on Sunday, the Israeli military released a video showing what it said was a tunnel discovered at the Shifa hospital. It's 55 meters long and about 10 meters below ground. They said the tunnel included a hole for gunmen to fire out of, and it ends at a blast-proof door that troops have not yet opened. Israeli forces have also released security camera video showing what they said were two foreign hostages, one Thai and one Nepalese, who were captured by Hamas in the October 7th attack and taken to the hospital. Hamas said its fighters brought them in for medical care. The military has previously released images of several guns it said were found inside an MRI lab and said the bodies of two hostages were found near the complex. VOA is not able to independently confirm the military's claims, and Hamas and hospital staff have denied the allegations of a command post under the Shifa hospital. Meanwhile, there have been attacks at another hospital in northern Gaza where thousands of people have been sheltering. The AP's Charles de la Desma has more. According to the health ministry in Hamas ruled Gaza and a medical worker inside the facility, a shell struck the second floor of the Indonesian hospital, killing at least 12 people. There's been no immediate comment from the Israeli military. Israeli forces are focused on clearing medical facilities that they say Hamas militants use for cover. The advance on the Indonesian hospital comes a day after the WHO evacuated 31 premature babies from the Shifa hospital in Gaza City, the territory's largest. They were among more than 250 critically ill or wounded patients stranded there. I'm Charles de Ledesma. A deal between Israel and Hamas to free dozens of hostages held in Palestine. Palestinian territories may be underway, according to a new report. Such a deal would likely bring at least a temporary pause to the fighting in Gaza and much-needed aid across the border. U.S. and Israeli officials say such a deal is not yet finalized. VOA's Arash Arab Asadi has more. The Washington Post reports that Israel and the U.S.-designated terror group Hamas are now close to agreement on a U.S. brokered deal to release dozens of hostages taken by Hamas in exchange for a five-day pause in fighting that would allow a significant boost to humanitarian aid. White House Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer speaking Sunday on ABC's This Week. We are not finished. Uh, There is not yet a deal in place, and I think uh, it would be premature uh, to conclude that this is inevitable, given how close uh, we have come uh, in the past. And I think one thing that I won't do is is go through all the outstanding uh, areas in which there are still uh, negotiations. We don't negotiate these things in public, uh, but uh, it is a very high priority to try to get this done. They're making some progress, and we hope that that will be concluded soon so that these people uh, can finally uh, come home. Israel's military has been conducting ongoing assaults on Gaza since Hamas brazenly attacked the country on October 7. About 1,200 people died in that attack, with what's believed to be around 240 hostages taken, many still missing. Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Michael Herzog speaking Sunday on ABC's This Week. We are hopeful that we can get uh, a significant significant number of uh, hostages freed in the coming days. I don't want to go into the details of uh, these talks. They are obviously very sensitive. The less uh, we go into the details, the better the chances of such a deal. But they are very serious efforts, and I'm hopeful that um, we can have a deal in the coming days. 
In the weeks following October 7, Israeli airstrikes and ground offensives killed more than 12,000 Palestinians, most of them civilians, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry in the West Bank. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, or UNRWA, estimates about 900,000 displaced people are sheltering in their facilities across the Gaza Strip, a number six times higher than their planned worst-case scenario. The World Health Organization reports Gaza's largest medical facility, the Shifa Hospital, is littered with medical and solid waste with a mass grave holding at least 80 bodies outside. But a recent effort by the WHO and the UN successfully evacuated premature babies to a site south of the facility. Director of UNRWA Affairs in Gaza, Thomas White, speaking on ABC's This Week. And for many of them, it's just, you know, they're thinking about how they provide for their family tomorrow. Um, but increasingly, people are very worried about what does the future hold for them? Uh, where are they going to live? Where are they going to get their children educated? Um, what does the future hold? And that's the, that's the big question in the minds of Gazans right now. The back and forth between Israel and Hamas is now in its sixth week, with only a fraction of humanitarian aid having so far reached Palestinian civilians caught in the crossfire. For them, a pause in fighting could mean the difference between death and life-saving supplies that cross the border. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. Updating Arash's story a little, the Prime Minister of Qatar, a mediator working to broker talks to free hostages held in Gaza in return for a ceasefire, said on Sunday that very minor challenges remain, but did not provide details or a timeline. The sticking points, uh, honestly, uh, uh, at this stage are more uh, practical, logistical, uh, not really uh, something represent the core of, of the deal. That's Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdulrahman Al Tahani. He's Qatar's prime minister and foreign minister. He said he's confident a deal is close. He added, The deal is going through uh, uh, ups and downs from time to time uh, throughout the last uh, few weeks. But uh, I think that, uh, you know, I'm now more confident that we are close enough to reach to uh, a deal that can bring the people uh, uh, safely back to their homes, whether they are the hostages on uh, Hamas side or whatever the exchange uh, uh, that will happen will take place from the Israeli side. Additionally, U.S. Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer told American media that they were, quote, closer than we have been in quite some time to securing a deal. We'll be visiting with a former prime minister of Lithuania later in the show. He's discussing a connection between the war against Hamas and Vladimir Putin. Now, preventing the Israeli-Hamas conflict from spreading into a wider regional war has been one of the top priorities of diplomats from around the world since the fighting started. It's not been an easy task. Iranian-backed proxy groups have been injecting themselves into the fight. Hezbollah to Israel's north, Islamic Jihad in Gaza, and the Houthis in Yemen have been launching rockets and drones toward Israel. And over the weekend, they've upped the ante yet again. Reuters' Zachary Goldman has the story. Ship tracking data from Refinitiv Icon on Sunday showed the location of a cargo vessel, Galaxy Leader, in the Red Sea after the ship was seized a day earlier by Iranian-backed militants in Yemen. Yemen's Houthi faction on Sunday said they'd captured what they said was an Israeli ship and taken it to a Yemeni port. A statement from the group said, quote, We are treating the ship's crew in accordance with Islamic principles and values. But Israel said earlier the Iran-aligned group had seized a British-owned and Japanese-operated cargo ship with no Israeli owners or crew. The Houthis an ally of Tehran, have been launching long-range missile and drone salvos at Israel in solidarity with the Palestinian Hamas militants Israel has been battling in the Gaza Strip since October 7. <laughs> Last week, the Houthi leader Abdul Malik al-Houthi said his group was also targeting Israeli vessels. Israel claims its Arrow missile defense system had shot down missiles flying over the Red Sea. Asked about the seizure of the Galaxy Leader, a U.S. defense official said, quote, We're aware of the situation and are closely monitoring it. That's Reuters' Zachary Goldman reporting for us today. 
And speaking of the sea, albeit a different one, the Israeli seaside city of Ashkelon is about 10 kilometers from the border of Gaza on the Mediterranean coast. Israeli officials say about 30 percent of the population has moved away because of rocket fire. Rahman Bunari filed this report, narrated for us by Kalim Afzal. In Ashkelon, Israel, the site of the country's Iron Dome anti-missile system intercepting rockets coming from Gaza has become a common sight. Because of its close proximity to northern Gaza, Ashkelon residents are advised to run for shelter within 10 seconds at the sound of the siren. Local authorities say around one-third of the population has left Ashkelon because of the constant threats of rockets from Gaza. Many residents like Yuel, who only gave Yue her first name, spent days inside after Hamas launched its attacks on October 7th. At the beginning of the war, I was in the shelter for one week. I didn't leave the house, so it was very hard for me because I didn't saw a person, I didn't, I didn't know nothing. Um, so it was very uh, scared. Oh, scared. It was very scared for me, and I'm used to it. It's quite here. There aren't many people on the streets or local roads. And Dina, a local who did not give us her last name, says schools have been closed since October 7. They don't go to school. The school is not safe right now for people in Ashkelon to go because the bombing is still happening. Every time there is a bombing, you can see it. Even yesterday, I think when you arrived, the bomb fell on a house. The seaport town is normally a thriving tourist spot. But now, most of the shops are either closed or have no customers. For Eman Buneri in Ashkelon, Israel, Kalim Afzal, VOA News. You're listening to Flashpoint Global Crises from the Voice of America. I'm Steve Karish in Washington. We'll visit with a former Lithuanian prime minister in a few minutes. But first, Kyiv. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin slipped unannounced into Kyiv on Monday to reassure Ukrainian leaders that the United States will continue to support their country's fight against Russia's invasion. VOA's Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb is traveling with the secretary on his surprise trip and has this report. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin's arrival in Kyiv early Monday was a brazen display of Western solidarity. It's his first visit to the Ukrainian capital since April 2022 and the first time members of the press made the surprise trip into the war-torn nation with him. Austin came here to discuss the immediate winter fight and to plan for future security assistance to Ukraine. Senior defense officials say the U.S. will provide a steady stream of security assistance throughout the winter. The most important capabilities in the coming weeks will be air defenses, according to officials, which the U.S. and Western allies have surged into Ukraine. The onset of winter has Ukraine and the West convinced that Russian President Vladimir Putin will resume its targeting of critical infrastructure as it did last winter, leaving many citizens without power in some of the coldest days of the year. Nearly 40 Iranian-made drones launched from Russian territory bombarded Ukrainian air defenses over the weekend. Ukraine said its forces destroyed 29 of the 38 drones, but those that made it through Ukraine's defenses struck multiple infrastructure facilities and caused power outages in more than 400 towns and villages throughout the country. Some of the drones also targeted Kyiv in the second attack on the capital so far this month. Ukrainian officials said all drones targeting the capital were shot down. Karla Bab, VOA News. Kyiv. Meanwhile, over the weekend, Ukraine experienced another wave of intense Russian shelling, impacting energy infrastructure. Also, Ukrainian forces have a confirmed advance in and around Adivka. Anna Chernikova is in Kyiv with the latest. On Saturday night, Russian forces attacked Ukraine with 38 Shahed drones. The Ukrainian Air Force confirmed the destruction of 29 drones. The attack began at 8 p.m. on November 17th and lasted until 4 a.m. on November 18th from the northern and southeastern directions. The city of Kyiv, the Kyiv region and the western and southern regions of Ukraine were targeted. In Odessa, a drone hit an energy infrastructure facility. As a result, 2,000 families in Odessa and Odessa region were left without electricity. One civilian employee was injured and hospitalized. 
On Monday morning, the Russian forces shelled the city of Kherson. Two civilians were killed and one injured after Russian forces hit the parking lot of a private transport company. The situation at the front line remains complicated for both sides. Ukrainian general staff confirmed that Ukrainian defense forces continue to hold positions on the left bank of the Kherson region and continue the shelling of the Russian positions. Also, Ukrainian forces reportedly succeed in their counteroffensive in the Avdivka direction, according to the analysis by researchers with the Institute for the Study of War. A Russian military blogger claimed that Ukrainian forces retook positions near the railway near Stepove and counterattacked near the Avdivka coke plant. At the same time, according to the report, Russian troops conducted offensive operations near Avdivka but did not achieve any confirmed success. The Ukrainian general staff reported that Russian troops had unsuccessful advance attempts in a 13-kilometer radius around Avdiivka. The latest ISW review notes that Ukrainian and Russian forces continue fighting in eastern and southern Ukraine, although rainy weather is likely to continue to slow the pace of fighting until winter arrives. Anna Chernikova, VOA News, Kyiv. Is there a connection between Hamas and Vladimir Putin? Is Putin benefiting from the war in the Middle East? For answers and analysis, Rafael Sakian of VOA's Russian service spoke with Andreas Kubilas. He's a member of the European Parliament and former prime minister of Lithuania. So, Mr. Kubilas, um, for now, geopolitically, uh, how would you describe the situation when we have two wars happening at the same time, Russia's aggression against Ukraine and Hamas terrorist uh, attacks on Israel and Israel's response, Israel's war against Hamas? Well, first of all, I would say I see some uh, connections in between Hamas and and Kremlin. We saw visits of uh, Hamas leaders uh, earlier in spring, and now after that terroristic attack again, they came to Moscow. And remembering, you know, Moscow, very tight connections with Iran, they are getting weapons and so on. So I see a uh, very simple development, simple and tragic development. Kremlin decided to spread, you know, uh, the war into new territories. And, uh, and for me, it means that we need to be much more united in our, you know, response. And of course... Uh, First of all, we need to fight uh, against uh, terrorist Hamas, like we were fighting against Al-Qaeda or, or ISIS. And second, we need to hit the center of such a terrorist you know, uh, unity and terrorist development, and it's Moscow. And we can do that, uh, you know, supporting Ukraine's victory uh, against the Russian army. So do you consider this Hamas attack as opening another front for Vladimir Putin, uh, for him to distract uh, the world from his aggression against Ukraine. I see it like uh, exactly as you have said, you know, as another uh, Putin's front, and not only to distract attention, but really to try to create as many you know problems for again for Europe, for European continent, like he did with his war, you know, when he supported Assad in Syria, and in such a way created you know huge flows of you know migrants to European continent. So this is his way how, you know, how to fight those, you know, new wars. And if we shall not stop, and if we shall not stop Putin, we should expect that, you know, still he has some other buttons, you know, to, to push and, to, and, and we can expect that we shall see that spread even going into new territory, spread of the war. Do you see and do you feel that uh, the Western support of Ukraine uh, here in the United States and also in Europe, in European countries, will not, uh, you know, get less because of this support of Israel at the same time with Ukraine? What do you think? Um, I think that it can be opposite, you know, and that uh, the Western leaders, once they will start to see that, you know, uh, this is you know, another front of Putin's uh, war. They will understand that really there is a need to have even more ambitious you know, strategy how to support Ukraine uh, in order really to defeat the Russian army in Ukraine. And that is what we are trying to do. You know, that's also one of the, of, of the purposes of my visit uh, here to, to Washington, D.C. On, on the first day of the war, uh, of Putin invasion into Ukraine, I initiated and we created a large 
uh, network of parliamentarians uh, with the title United for Ukraine. Now we have more than 400 parliamentarians all over the world, uh, even from, from Washington, D.C. And we said, you know, in a very simple way, that Ukrainians will fight uh, the military Eastern Front. We need to be ready to fight political battles in the Western Front. Exactly in order to keep, you know, uh, this support for Ukraine, you know, not to allow Western capitals to start to declare that they are feeling fatigue or something like that. And now also we're looking how to uh, expand our network, United for Ukraine network, also in, on to, down to the state level of United States, you know, into the state uh, legislations, uh, legislations, you know, into state congresses, really um, uh, trying to to build some kind of uh, network uh, of political infrastructure in order really to be successful during the next decade, because I'm absolutely sure that uh, Ukraine will be our geopolitical priority for the whole decade with, you know, Ukrainian winning the war as, as quickly as, as, as it is possible, but also with reconstruction, with integration towards EU, with the membership in NATO, because that is now the most important geopolitical battle in the world. Andreas Kubilis is a member of the European Parliament and former prime minister of Lithuania. He was speaking with VOA's Russian service earlier this month. And finally today, an optimistic story from Israel. The Hamas attack on October 7th and the subsequent military operation have deepened the division between Jews and Muslims within Israeli society, though some families remain steadfast in their belief that Arabs and Jews can coexist, and learning how to live together starts in school. Pilar Sebrian has the story narrated for us today by Veronica Villafanie. Guy El Hanan is an Israeli who has made the deliberate choice of enrolling his children in a unique school environment where Jewish and Muslim students attend classes together. Well, there are many benefits. If I have to choose one, is that they lack this very uh, essential component of the Israeli Jewish identity, which is a uh, fear of the other. Guy says he is fighting against an Israeli society entangled in conflict and moving towards a future marked by division, estrangement and confrontation. Generations on generations of uh, very fruitful, beyond fruitful, I mean the Jewish and the Arabic culture, Muslim culture group together. They can't exist without each other. That's why he wanted his children to attend school alongside other Muslim students. Israeli Arabs, descendants of Palestinians who integrated into the state of Israel after it became independent in 1948. Arabs make up about 21 percent of the country's population. And among that minority population, his son's best friends. Haifa is a unique city in Israel. It's among the rare places where mixed couples live, where both Jewish and Muslim communities come together, fostering an atmosphere of mutual tolerance. This environment encourages dialogue on pressing issues, including the recent war in Gaza. Ma. This was evident during a recent weekend at Haifa's Mahmoud Mosque, where Jews and Muslims converged to share an evening, sending a message of peace and coexistence to the rest of the country. Muhammad Sharif Ode is president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in Haifa. I invite all our neighbors that are afraid from us, I don't know why they are afraid, to tell them we are living here uh, before Israel and after Israel in a peaceful way and we live together in the neighborhood in uh, the coexistence. For the moment, the Gaza war has created divisions that threaten to spread beyond Gaza. But here in this place, where Israelis and Muslims share space, there are those who still believe that conflict resolution and a lasting peace is achievable.